well, we're going to uh, just have a few thoughts on this, and then I'm going to uh, get a, 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 vi a video up that um, uh, the Bible Project have put on this, and uh, so you've got the opportunity to look at it a bit more uh, closely as to what the actual words might say. But here we go. Approaching God's Word and approaching New Year 2004. This psalm is about choices. There are two choices here. It talks about the way and the path of the wicked, but also talks about the way of the righteous. Two paths. So we've got two choices. We've got two ways or paths. And ultimately, they lead to two destinies. Now, Psalm 1 is a very interesting psalm indeed. It is described as the porchway that brings us into the entire book of Psalms. There are 150 psalms, and they're, spread, they're, they're organized into five books of psalms, as, as, as it's uh, described. But Psalm 1 very deliberately sets out how you approach the psalms as a believer, and what are the choices that face people, because many of the psalms are quite angry at what the wicked are doing, as well as joyful about what God is doing. And so this is how we approach God's Word and its centrality to it. And you can see from the uh, first reference here, it says, uh, blessed is the one, verse 1, who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Have you got the picture? I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. So I'm still going, I'm still going, I'm still going. But which way am I going to go? Is it that way? Or is it that way? I've got a choice in the road. What way do I go? And if I take that way, where do I, how far do I go before I just stop? I've stopped walking, I'm standing. And then I'm starting to get comfortable. I think I'll just sit down. Where have I got to? I've landed somewhere, I've made a decision, but in doing so, this verse points out that those who make the wrong decision end up in the way of the wicked, in the way of sinners, and in the way of those who are mockers, scoffers. Now, Pilgrim's Progress was a very famous book written about 350 years ago. And during the journey of the pilgrim, whose name is Christian, he came along with a chap called Hope. And they came until they found a place where they saw a way in, uh, that, that uh, uh, put itself across the road, and it seemed to lie as straight as the way in which they should go. But they didn't know which way of the two to take, because both directions seemed equally straight and equally uh, sensible to follow. And while they were considering that, uh, a man uh, dressed in a brilliant white robe came along and said to them, why, why are you stood there? And so they said, we're going to the celestial city but knew not which of these ways to take. Follow me, said the man, it is there that I'm going. So they followed him in the way that came into a nice broad road. And then by degrees that road turned and turned them so far from the city that they wanted to go to that they ended up facing the other direction. And they still followed this uh, man through. But by and by, as it says, before they were aware, he led them both to a net, and they got entangled, and they didn't know what to do. And then the white robe fell off the man's back, and they realized they had been tricked, and they lay crying for some time because they could not get themselves out. Now, that's how Pilgrim's Progress explains choices that face men and women, boys and girls today. The book of Proverbs says this, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. We have choices to make each day. And Jesus, of course, explained this in the uh, teaching he gave. He says, enter the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And so, what is the choice that we face? And how can we make sure we take the right direction? Well, this verse in the psalm, as you can see, 
talks about the blessing of someone who avoids the wrong way, doesn't listen to the counsel or get in step with the wicked the people that are trying to pull us away, or even sit down with the scoffers. Instead, the focus, the guide, the lodestar that we have to follow is the Bible. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Our delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it meditates day and night. And so today I'm asking the question, are you a delighter in the law of the Lord? Do you meditate on it day and night? Does it wake you up sometimes in the middle of the night as you reflect on what am I doing? Where am I going? Am I on the right road? Am I really following Jesus? Or am I deluding myself and listening to the siren voices? And uh, it then describes the impact that following Jesus makes upon a person's life, following the Bible. Because in, uh, what they are like is like a tree planted by streams of water, an everlasting supply of fresh water, and that its leaf never withers, and every season it gives fruit. We're a fruitful disciple. You cannot be a fruitful disciple unless the roots go down into God's word and into the water of life. And whatever they do prospers. By the way, that's not the prosperity gospel. It doesn't mean you're going to make a million pounds or you win the lottery, you know. It means prosper in God's eyes and in Christian maturity and in confidence in God. The next verse, verse 4, uh, then compares that to those who take the wrong way, the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. What is chaff? Well, when the wheat or barley is harvested, what the farmer really wants are the little kernels, the, 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 the corn uh, from, from the plant, but there's a lot of straw and other stuff there. And what they do, there's various ways of doing it, but what uh, they used to do and, uh, in, in more uh, um, ancient cultures was that they would take the two and either would sieve them together and all the straw and all the fluffy bits, the chaff as they call it, would disappear. Or else they would take a big uh, um, uh, st uh, uh, fork and throw it up on a windy day and the wind would blow the chaff away and the corn would fall to the ground. And they would separate the two out. Uh, it's the chaff that the wicked are compared to. No foundation, no good, no value to anyone, and that's the way to avoid. And the outcome, the destiny of those who follow those is made clear in this next verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Warning, there is a judgment. It says in Hebrews, it's appointed unto uh, people once to die, and after that, the judgment. It says even of Christian believers, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There is a reckoning at the end of this life, particularly for those who ignore and avoid God. Sinners will not stand in the assembly of the righteous heaven, as we might call it. And the, the Bible, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 this psalm ends uh, with this simple verse in verse 6. Two paths, the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. There's the outcomes, the destination. We're going to watch a video that Bible Project has done, uh, and for those who are uh, watching this on the uh, internet or uh, on, on YouTube or whatever, uh, we would encourage you to go to Bible Project and look for Psalm 1 and click on that and watch it through yourselves so that you can enjoy some of the teaching there. They look a little bit more closely at some of the key words in it to help you understand a bit more. So let's show that now. Question simple. How do you read the Bible? And what's the best way to get through it and keep going through it? And so I'm going to just go through a few simple practical tips and helps. And in front of me, I've, I've put out on the table a whole load of helps and support uh, um, and different things. And some of them you can take home with you if you want. Uh, and you can reflect on them yourself. But number one is the obvious thing. How do I read the Bible? Well, it's a big book, and the best way is to read it daily. The important thing is, of course, is to read it all. Can you imagine you are, uh, say, some of your soldiers, 
and that you're on your exercise and your wife or your girlfriend writes to you and you get a letter from her and you grab the letter and say, it says, my dearest, uh, darling, lovey, dovey, what tea. And um, you look at that and think, oh, isn't, isn't that soppy? Oh, that's lovely. And then you put it in your pocket and walk away. What would be the sense in that? You're going to take it out and you're going to read it right through, pour over every... Did she really mean that? You're going to go through it carefully. You're going to read the whole lot, not just a little bit. You'll want to keep going. But it's important, of course, to read it prayerfully. To have a little look at what that means as well. Because it's not just God speaking to you. The opportunity is there to speak and discover and speak through to him and bring it into your life. And then importantly, read it with understanding. It is a difficult book in places. Nobody could object to that. But there are ways and helps available. And another important thing is not just to try and read it on your own, which please do, because much of what I'll say is about that, but also use the facilities of this church, of a house group, of coming to hear sermons, but also there are other ways of working and having fellowship in house groups or meeting together in small, small groups to read together with others. So let's see, how do we read it daily? Uh, there are so many ways of helping us do that. There are lots of guides and little support booklets given out, but I think one of the ones that I find so helpful is this. There's a little uh, article here that's called Seven Minutes with God. And it describes how a lot of people uh, encouraged at, at university would say, just spend seven minutes. Now, they don't mean just seven minutes, but they're trying to get people started in the daily routine, a habit of getting alone with God and getting alone with his word. You know the idea, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a destiny. And if we want the word of God to be part of that destiny, we need to do it daily. And it's a big book to get through. So there are various methods, but one of the ones that we have used every year, and you'll notice that tomorrow is Monday. It's the 1st of January. And so you can make a start tomorrow or even tonight when you get home. And this little pamphlet here shows how you can read it through uh, by ticking off each uh, chapter or verses, whatever, each day, and it gets you through all the way to the, uh, the end of December. And uh, there are, are, are references. You can go through the New Testament uh, and the Old Testament. You can do both at once, or you can do it over two years. That way we'll get you through. So they're there. They're free. Go and take as many as you need. Um, the other thing that can help if you have got one is that as you read it, and this is very important, it's a big book. You'll get lost in it. So if you've read it, did I read John last February, or oh, did, did I read Mark? The thing you'll need is a diary. So go down to the town and just wait, give it a few more days, and then you'll get a cheap diary in the shops, and uh, then write down what you read, and then write some notes. It. Now, if you can't afford a diary, I've got one here. Um, these are, are called oxygen, and these ones lay out uh, each day uh, reading from that little pamphlet uh, that you can follow through. You can write notes and also advice on what prayers you could uh, make. It, it's, it gives a list of you know, pray for my family, pray for my enemies, pray for my work, and so on. It's all in there, but there's a few of those available if anyone feels they would like to use that. But I would encourage you to get a diary. But that's one way to get started in going through it. But of course, all of this is available online, and uh, for many of us, we use uh, our, um, uh, our iPads, our phones, or whatever, our computers, and you can get all the applications uh, to go through the Bible, and there are loads of methods on offer of how you can map your own way for a diary each day and tick off as you read through, and you can take as long as you like over that. So there's lots of stuff. I've given examples here of um, Olive Tree Software and Takarta, which is one I use, and there's a, a, an app called the Bible Gate Gateway. It's free. And every version in English is available. So if you don't like the King James Version, use the New International or use the New uh, Revised Standard. They're all there online, and you can put them in your iPhone. Everything is So there is no excuse nowadays not to have access to a Bible. But listen, how do you eat an elephant? Answer, one spoonful at a time. You will get through it. You will get through an elephant eventually. But Take it gently. How do you eat the Bible? 
It's a big book. There are 66 books in all, and um, it takes quite a while to read through, but it's one step at a time. And that little book booklet, that I, or that little leaflet, guides you through to get to the end. How long does it take? How long is a piece of string? As long as you get from the beginning to the end, you will get through it. And it's just a question of pacing yourself. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mind you, having said that, when I was 17 or 18 and just came to Christ, uh, I'll just share something with you. When I came to Jesus, I'd been at a, an exciting youth fellowship weekend, and uh, there was a famous speaker. He was actually the Bishop of Karamoja in Uganda, uh, and a uh, lovely chap who had really made me think that I, I didn't have the faith that he had. But I went home, and in the quietness of my own bedroom, I opened the Bible, the old King James Version with the these, thou's, and whatnot. And I went through the Sermon on the Mount, and I then started reading it again. There was nobody there. It was just me and the Bible and Jesus. And I came to faith because I sought first the kingdom of God and put my trust. And every day since then, as much as I can remember, I have constantly gone back to that Bible, not the original one, the, uh, the ones that I use now, so that I understand more. And that was over 50 years ago. And it's important to do a step at a time because that way you get through. My brother and another fellow called John said, let's have a race and see who can get through the Bible as quickly as possible. I think I did it in one year and five months. My brother was a little bit quicker. Uh, John, uh, his name is John Scott and I, and is the Reverend John Scott, did it in four months. Um, so you can go through if you just have nothing else to do in life. But um, all I'm trying to say is it's not a race, it's not a competition, but it's an opportunity to discipline and try and see what's it all about. And guess what happens when you get to the end? You've got it. You go back to the beginning again. And uh, um, uh, you know, I started yesterday, Genesis chapter 1, because I've completed the Bible, and I, I do it every year. And um, I'm starting again, so I'm, I'm ahead of the game, because I started before the first. But you get what I mean? You just keep going, because every time you go through, it's like a different journey. You see different things. I have a friend who, uh, uh, well, he, I'll not hold it against him, but he, he was an Englishman. But he used to come to Northern Ireland, and he used to share the good news with us. He was a great, great Bible teacher. And he was saying to us that um, he uh, would take the aircraft and would fly over, and he'd notice in the middle of the Irish Sea there was a lump of island. And he looked down and he thought, well, that must be the Isle of Man. I, I wonder, can I pick anywhere out? Well, on the way home, he would look down. I said, oh, there's Douglas. I know where that is. Oh, that must, that's the mountain called Snaefell. Well, then the next time he came to Northern Ireland, he'd be looking to see which roads and other little villages. Each time you fly over the Isle of Man, you recognize a bit more. Every time you go through the Bible, something new comes and hits you in the face because there's so much in it. It's so rich. And so that's why it's such a joy and encouragement. And so I would encourage you, take three years over it, take one year over it, take five years. It doesn't matter. It's not a race, but it is a fulfilling ambition to get through and find. So uh, tomorrow you have no excuse. First of January, make a start, see how long. If you do three chapters every day and five on a Sunday, you will get to the end of the Bible by about the 26th of December. So you'll have a few days spare, all right? But I'm just trying to give the, the you know, um, if you want to take two years over, New Testament, one year old, whatever. It's not a race, but it is important to hear the whole counsel of God. Not just the bits that, uh, I, I, love, I love going back to that bit, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, if I have the, Tongues of men, of angels, but have not learned. Oh, we always like the, the nice passages you hear at weddings. No, you need to get through the whole lot, even the, the bits of the uh, tabernacle and all that, to find out what God's real big plan and purpose was. Thirdly, read it prayerfully. It's not just there to be a study guide. It's not just there to be an academic exercise. No, it's to affect and change the heart. It's to be prayed in that God might change me as I read this word, that I might understand something better I can share with others, but also something I need to change in my life, perhaps. Is God speaking to me, and how can I carry this out? It needs to be prayerfully used. And more important, Jesus used the Bible prayerfully. He went out for nights of prayer and disappeared from all the apostles so that he could have time alone with God. Prayer is important. But every time the 
Satan challenged him, Jesus' response was, it is written. The Bible is a sword, it says in Hebrews. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. In other words, when tempted, what is it in the Bible that I can reflect on that will make me avoid this sin? And so Jesus applied that and set that example. Read it prayerfully. Read it with understanding. Guess what? You are not the only one. You are not the first one to have ever become a Christian. You're not the only one to have struggled with some passages in the Bible. Godly people have done so years before you. How can you instantly get yourself taller? Do you know? How can I instantly make myself taller? I shall stand on the shoulder of a giant. And there are many, many giant godly people who have written books galore. Now, I'm just throwing a few out in front of you here, but there are different types of books. There's, uh, there's commentaries galore here. Uh, this one here I got as a school prize when I was 18 or 17. Uh, and uh, it goes through every book of the Bible, gives the background, the introduction, all that. Sort of, there's plenty of help and support that you can look to that get deeper into God's Word but help you grow. One other thing that I find very important is this here. This is my new international version. You don't need to have this version, but there are many versions that have what's called a study Bible. When you open a study Bible, you see the Bible words, but there are lots of notes, and sometimes there's nice little maps as well that explain things. And having that in front of you, when you read a verse and you think, where's that? And the map is there, or what's that about? And there's a note at the bottom explaining it, that is so helpful, and I strongly encourage people to either buy one of these or to use one online. And having said buy one, I hope you got uh, book tokens or something for Christmas because you need to spend them and invest in good books, a good Bible for a start, a study Bible, but also other helpful Christian books, not just stories of fantastic miracles that people think they've they've been through, but rather help to understand what the Bible teaches, uh, little guides and things like that. So invest in your future. Spend money buying a decent Bible, but also a decent uh, library. Build one up of books that can help and instruct and take you forward. And there's uh, nice things here such as the uh, New Bible Dictionary. Uh, there, There are a whole load of things that happen in the Bible I haven't a clue about. But you go to the dictionary, not only will it show you the maps, it'll give you all sorts of little background details and then point you to various verses. This is an unbelievably helpful book for a a, a Christian. The best book of the lot, where is it? There it is in the middle. I think this is terrific. This is the best of the lot, the Lion Handbook of the Bible. Beautiful color illustrations. There's lots of the uh, pictures of Israel, of each book of the Bible. It's all very carefully explained, and I think this is brilliant. If you haven't given someone a Christmas present, get them one of these, and that will help them on their faith. And if you haven't got it yourself, get one. I hope you get what I'm trying to say. Searching, going through, growing as a believer, feeding yourself, not just other people giving you sermons and other things, feeding yourself is critical to becoming that tree by the water and that one that will withstand the storms. Invest in that, spend time in it, and also grow through it. And I just mentioned this at the end. Don't keep it to yourself. Get into a house group. Join with others. Meet informally. It doesn't have to be a big house group in the church. It has to be two, three. Maybe just have a prayer together and read a few verses and ask yourselves, what's this about? Share experiences, but also, above all, Share understanding. These are the kinds of things that one can do. These are the kinds of things that turns us into the right way and helps us to discern where the wrong way is and where the right way is. That gives us the weapons to fight back the evil one, but above all gives us the bread of life to grow as believers.